world of entertainment has come a long way. There have been new inventions and new devices, and yet the art of acting is still a, an eternal one. And la a few nights ago, I was at a movie house in the neighborhood seeing the film when comedy was king, and it was a recreate excerpt from some of the fantastically ingenious two-reelers of some of the geniuses of the past, not, well, some of now, but of the silent film. There was a, a piece of Chaplin, a piece of Langdon, and a piece of Buster Keaton, who is our delighted to have as our guest this morning. But Buster Keaton, I think of you, aside from this film I saw the other night, I think of you in terms of some of these critics who speak of Keaton, one of the geniuses of the silent film. Your approach, your approach in so many of these films, these two reelers and feature films you did, was the man never spoke, of course, but how was it done? That there were subtitles. That's right. Oh, yeah. No, your lips moved. You, you spoke. And in the cutting room, you'd simply run the film through your fingers down to where you just got your mouth open, and on the second syllable, you'd cut, slap in your subtitle. It's explains what you're talking about. And then when you come back, you pick it up just as your mouth is about to close. So that was the way that was but done. But what you had to say, you had to communicate to the audience in only one way, through action, through pantomime. That's right. We eliminated subtitles just as fast as we could if we could possibly tell it in action. I remember you once told me something about ten years ago about you and Charlie Chaplin having friendly contests. Uh, who could do the feature film with the least amount of subtitles? I think Chaplin won that. He got down one of his pictures, uh, something like 21 titles, and I had 23. And yeah, this is for an hour and a half film, something like yeah, that. Yeah, seven reel picture. We started off with our features, were only five reelers, but I think around... Uh, mm, see about 25 we we're in seven reels became a standard length for uh, all featured pictures thinking about the but way another you... thing too you got to call attention to is the average picture used 240 titles that was about the average 240 was the average yes and the most i ever used was 56 56 and at one time you used 20 23 we, again, we think of you saying something to... Like, at this theater, at this movie house, there were young kids, couples who weren't even born. Perhaps their parents weren't born at the time these films were made, yet they were laughing, they were howling. And it gives one the impression that uh, this humor is eternal, that there seems to be a hunger for it now, too. There's so little of it today. So I was wondering about your feelings uh, as you watch TV. You notice some of the gags are repeated, aren't they, in different locations? They have to. You can't dig material up that fast. I've refused to do a weekly show because it's the fastest way to a sanitarium that I know of. Drive you absolutely out of your mind trying to dig up. Well, I always tried to dig up new material, and uh, it's just impossible. Well, back in the days of the silence, when you'd invent a gag, a sight gag, it had to be for each film, or for that matter, for each reel of the film, it had to be something fresh and different each time. Yes. We didn't repeat gags, and we didn't steal from each other, either. Well, I'm thinking about this film I saw the other night. Uh, you were a, a, a moving man. Y you were Buster Keaton, without the smile, and you had the pancake hat on. I'll ask you about that in a moment. And you were the moving man, but you got involved in a big police parade, and there were thousands of police, and it became like a dream. You gummed up the parade, so they were chasing you. you know, well, I tried to cut through the parade, and I couldn't do it, so I just joined it. Before anybody could stop me, some anarchist up on top of a building threw a bomb down on the police parade, but it lit in my wagon, so when it went off, the whole police force was after me. And it was like a dream to me. Thousands yeah. of policemen were chasing this one man. Never quite caught you. Now we come to your art, the art of the, the, act, the way you move, your body, the acrobatics and everything. Where did this originate? Oh, well, that's, you're yeah. just doing a hit-and-miss routine there, just <laughs> ducking <laughs> cops in all directions. It just come an ordinary chase sequence. Well, on this chase sequence, how much of it was planned way in the beginning and how much came out in the actual doing? How much was improvised, you know? Well, as a rule, <clears throat> oh, about 50% you have in your mind before you start the picture, and the rest you develop as you're making it. As you're making it, the ideas yes. come to mind. Yeah. As I look at you now, Buster Keaton, I'm going to... Uh, I see something here that James Agee, the film critic, wrote about you in his 
very excellent article, Comedy's Greatest Era, that appeared in Life a couple of years ago. He says, Keaton's face ranked almost with Lincoln's as an early American archetype. It was haunting, handsome, almost beautiful, yet it was irreducibly funny. He improved matters by topping it off with a deadly horizontal hat as flat and thin as a phonograph record. One can never forget Keaton wearing it, standing erect at the prow as a little boat is being launched. The boat goes grandly down the skids and just as grandly straight onto the bottom. Keaton never budges. The last you see of him, the water lifts the hat off the stoic head and it floats away. The hat. Do you That's know what right. film he was talking about That's there? That's called The Boat. That was The Boat. Now, what of the hat? Uh, the paraphernalia first. How did the paraphernalia... Well, well, I had a similar hat on the stage before I went into pictures. I went into pictures when I was 21 years old at, in the spring of 1917. And you were part of an acting family? Right? Yes. I understand it was Harry Houdini who gave you the name of Buster. Well, I was born with the Keaton Houdini Medicine Show Company on a one-night stand in Kansas. And what was your work at the time when you were the kid? Uh, uh, well, my old man was an eccentric comic, and... Uh, as soon as I could take care of myself at all on my feet, he had slap shoes on me and big baggy pants. And then just start doing gags with me, and especially kicking me clean across the stage or taking me by the back of the neck and throw me. And as I grew used to doing it and knew how to do it, it the throws become longer. And by the time I got up to around seven and eight years old, we were called the roughest act that was ever in the history of the stage. And so when the, when the movies came along, you were a veteran now at the I, cost of... I was a veteran bag. when I went into pictures. Well, of course, the question would come up, your, the approach of you and humor, first your face, of course, the, the lack of the smile, the sorrowful, sad face, of course, made the audience howl all the more. Well, you see, I learned that from the stage, that I was the type of comedian that if I laughed at what I did, the audience didn't. So I just automatically got to that stage where the more seriously I took my work, the better laughs I got. You were always, in everything you did, there was always the dead yes. seriousness. So by the time I went into pictures, not smiling was, was mechanical with me. I just didn't pay attention to it. Now, you, you just used the word mechanical, which brings us to another point. Uh, A.G. and Iris Barry, in this excellent book by Griffith and Mayer, speak of you as the master of what they call the mechanical gag. Uh, Chaplin in modern times uh, was kidding the machine. But there's a difference here between the two that Iris Barry points out. I think uh, if you could expand on this. Uh, Buster Keaton moves in the mechanized world today like the inhabitant of another planet. He gazes with frozen bewilderment at a nightmare reality. Inventions and contrivances like deck chairs and railroad engines seem animate. They seem alive to him in the same measure that human beings become impersonal. And without friends or relatives... He's generally incapable of associating with his fellow beings on a human basis, but mechanical devices, almost inimical to him, are the only beings who can understand him. And then she goes on to speak of uh, Chaplin escaping into the realm of freedom in his films, but you actually throw your humanity into the machine world, and you make the machine so much part of yourself. Would you mind telling us a bit about this, you and the machines, the way you work with... Well, I guess I found out that... I get my best material working with something like that. In other words, I was the one of your original do-it-yourself fellas. I may not know how to do a carpenter's job, but I set out to build a house. And then as you build it, it becomes funny and funnier. Well, right? Everybody knows that you, you're going to get in trouble when you start that. Thinking about today, I mean, why your humor is so alive today, today with more and more machines. Uh, the Keaton humor and those early two reelers seem even more pertinent today. Have you thought of... Uh, has the idea of recreating silent films on using today as a basis occurred to you? Well, I wouldn't try to create new films. To commence with, I'm uh, past the age of uh, being able to do the jumping around, the wild action stuff that I did. But uh, I still try. But I'm not going to remake any of those. I'm going to reissue them. Who oh, you are? Yes, I'm just back from Europe, and. Uh, Went through to Munich, and in passing Paris, I found out that this comedy as King was playing in four theaters there. Then I found out they were playing in six theaters in London, about three in West Berlin. 
even down into Munich, which is one of their big labs, studios. And the exhibitor says, have you got any pictures we can have? I mean, the silence. Says, no, but I'm going to make sure you get them. So I, in Munich, made arrangements to give them dupe negatives because I found prints. The original negatives have practically gone. But finding good prints of all these old pictures that I could get a good dupe negative off of and give them to them there in Munich, they will make me new prints, some with the subtitles of uh, in French, some in German, some in Italian, some Spanish, and some in English. And all we do is put a full orchestration music track to those silent pictures with no moderator and leave the old-fashioned subtitles in, but a good musical score behind them and re-release them. And this yeah. is going to happen within the next couple of months. These are some features as well as the yeah. short ones? And it, it'll start in Europe first because uh, television hasn't uh, wrecked the, all the neighborhood motion picture theaters there. So you got an awful lot of theaters. Well, as soon as I see what they're going to do there, then I'll have prints made for here. Uh, a navigator general among them? Yes, I'll, I'll have uh, 18 two-reelers and 10 features. And, well, one thing is pretty clear, apparently, in what you tell me, that the art of the silent film is universal. It doesn't matter what, there's no language barrier involved. No, we all. found out that long ago. Now, I mind you, this picture you saw cops yeah. is exactly 40 years old. Hard to believe. Made in 1920. The youngest picture of the silence that I'll have will be a uh, 27, which would be 33 years old. 33 years would be. Yeah, that'd be the youngest. The most recent. Thinking about you and uh, parodying, kidding some of the serious silent films, too. I notice in this book of Griffith and Mayer, there's Keaton as, as Hamlet, but here you are as the cowboy hero. What, well, what happened? Well, I tried to be Bill Hart. In that picture. Frozen North. Yeah, I had a little trouble, but I tried my best to be Bill Hart. So much so that Bill Hart didn't speak to me for a couple of years after I made it. He's he thought I was kidding him. I said, I didn't kid you, Bill. I was trying to be an actor like you, and I didn't quite make it. <laughs> Would you mind telling us about that? He's William S. Hart, the strong, silent hero who always loses the girl, a noble hero. And well, that was only the last part of his career. For some reason, he, he kind of turned ham on us. He was a great actor, but he got hammy at the end of his career, and he always looked for the opportunity to cry, even with the two guns strapped to his side out in the desert. The girl turned and looked at another man, tears ran down his cheeks. There's nothing you could do about it. He was his own producer. So what did you do in your film? Oh, I cried too. Glycerin tears but now one eye, you told me. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> what of the... You did take off Cecil B. DeMille, too, in the big extravaganzas back then. Oh, any time I had a bathroom scene or a bedroom <laughs> scene, I'd tr try to make a DeMille set out of it. I'm looking at a picture, a photograph of you, a film, uh, which I don't know, called Daydreams in 1922. But it seemed... And you you were... Uh, you dreamt you being a famous surgeon. Well, this or, was a vision. Uh, Hamlet. It's that like picture there is a, like a dream. Uh -huh. Dream sequence. I imagine myself as a great physician. I'm thinking, since you mentioned dream, that coming back to the movie involving the cops, the one in, when comedy was king, the thought occurred to you that it was like a dream, that all, all your movies are like a wild dream? You know, we dream of strange well, things. Well, some of the two reelers were. We got so wild and crazy in them. We lost all of that when we started making feature pictures. We had to stop doing impossible gags and what we call cartoon gags. They had to be believable, or your story wouldn't hold up. Now, let's see if I could follow that. For a feature picture, then, you had to abandon the wild gags. That's right. It? But it didn't... For instance, I'm the fellow that got up on a high diving platform at a country club and did a swan dive off of it and missed the pool and went through the ground. People come running up and look down the hole, and the scene faded out, and the title come in and says, years later, I faded back in on the country club, and the pool was empty, and grass growing into it, and the whole place neglected, nobody around, and I came up out of the hole with a Chinese wife and two kids. <laughs> well, I, 
that was a fade out of a two reeler. We wouldn't have dared use that in a. Let's say I don't a believe. Feature picture. But still, you have the why. You still use a lot of imagination though, on the, as in oh, yes. as a general or Sherlock Junior. There was uh, a lot of the critics left to talk about your chases, the imagination of a chase today when. We see a chase. It's one. It's one dimension. You know, someone chases around, and there's a verbal gag. But when you were being chased, the talk of the film Sherlock Junior was it? Yeah. Sherlock Junior. When you miss the girl, the girl misses you, and it, this goes on for it seems for hours. And yet each time something different. Finally, you fall down a chute, and you land on a. Uh, I think the plank breaks, and you yeah. pop right in her arms. Yes. Oh, well, that's in the Navigator. The Navigator. Yeah. Well, how did how did a gag like this come into being? Well, those we sit around and talk about for. Quite a while before we start the picture, and then take advantage of anything that happens to add to it. What of what of you? The uh, this yeah, is a yeah, this is a, a shock to anybody that's in the motion picture business today. I mean, your veterans of the, of the pictures of the last twenty five years or so that didn't know the, the silent days. A feature-length picture. Neither Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, or myself ever had a script. That sounds impossible to anybody today in the picture business. We never even thought of writing a script. We didn't need to. By the time we had talked and worked out what we thought was a picture, for instance, we always got a start. People always come up with a start. Says, That's funny. That's a good start. All right, we want to know the finish. Right then and there, see. There's nothing else to work on but the finish. And if we can't round it out, just something we like, we throw that one away and start on a new one. But when we get the start and the finish, we've got it because the finish, the middle, we can always take care of. That's easy. Sure. So by the time we get through talking about it and you got this all set, enough to start, my prop man knows the props he's going to have to get. The wardrobe man knows the wardrobe. The guy that builds the sets, he knows what sets they want, and you help him design them. So that there's no need for a script. We all know what we're going to do. And then if I build a nice set here, says we got to make this a, a, an important set, make it look good, and so forth. We find out that the routine I intended to do in there is, is laying an egg. It's not holding up. But a broom closet off of it got me in trouble. So. In, I end up shooting only two minutes of film in the big set, and half a reel in the in the broom closet. See, all well, right. so uh, what good would a script been to me? We just throw gags out right and left when we're shooting because they don't stand up and they don't work well, and then the accidental ones come. So here's the case of the actual freshness, the fresh yes. routine coming out of the accident. That's right. Now, this is, I suppose, the accident art you might call it. Nothing, you have a beginning and an end, and that's all. That's right. And then yeah. let what happens happen, depending on your imagination. And yeah. Now, we, always, we could always go into any story and, and, and pad and fill in the middle. Well, that what, was the easy part. Well, you would direct uh, some of these films, too. Well, I, <clears throat> quite a few pictures I would take a director with me and just co-direct with him. And, but the majority I did alone. Well, what about, this would also make the other actors, too, be more imaginative. It's challenge them too. They would do something that you would oh, allow yes. them. Oh yes, we want to. Another thing we didn't do in those days that they do today is we didn't rehearse a scene to perfection. We didn't want that because we got it was mechanical then. We'd much rather for any of our big roughhouse scenes where there's a lot of falls and people hitting each other or whatever. We never rehearsed those. We only just sat down and talked about it and says, "Now it's he drops that that chair." You come through that door and come through fast. And as this person here sees you coming and throws up their hands, that from the center door, you can see it. Now you come through and you'll just about hit him. If you miss him, get her. <laughs> now that's the way we, we laid those scenes out. Because when we did those roughhouse scenes, if you had to do it the second time, invariably somebody skinned up an elbow or bumped a knee or something like that, now they'll shy away from it the next take. Or they'll favor it. So you seldom got a, a scene like that good the second time. You generally got him that first one. And anybody in that scene is free to do as he pleases as long as he keeps that action going. So even your extras can use their imagination. 
Even the extras can use yeah. it. Because what you're saying here to me is a very uh, pertinent point. Even the extras can use We're so accustomed to have everything planned today. The hell, I mean, everything today is... It's a multi-million dollar project. Everything's planned. And yeah, they rehearse so scenes to perfection before they ever turn the camera over. And with us, it used to be the other way. We tried to eliminate that. We didn't want any <laughs> anything to look mechanical. Maybe that's one of the reasons there was so much laughter in the house the other night and when comedy was king, is that we had the feeling. I mean, the younger people and I had this feeling that what we were seeing was happening now, that it has happened only once. It was not something that was pre-done and done and done. I'll show you, for, uh, for instance, uh, Hank Mann one time, when he was a newcomer, Senator had never heard of him, nobody else had, but he happened to get in as an extra in one of the cop chase scenes. He wanted to do something, and he hadn't the slightest idea what to do until the last second. He was standing outside of a building that had caught fire, and the police could, uh, had sent for the fire department, so he got the fire department and the police department in, in the scene. Hank Mann come out of the burning building, took a look around, put a cigarette in his mouth, and, and uh, lit it off of the burning building. And walked off in the, in the projecting room. Senate saw it, and he says, who was that so-and-so? He says, well, just one of the extra guys. He says, well, get him. He's all right. We keep him here for a while. As simple as that. Yes. Yeah. saw uh, an unknown, uses uh, an imagination. An unknown. Using his imagination. imagination. Well, since, a cigarette off a burning building. Since you've mentioned Max Sennett, we think of the Keystone Cops. I guess one of the reasons so much laughter, too, in these early films, pomposity is being kidded, or authority, the cops say. Yeah. The cop was always, always kidded, but there was a great deal of laughter involved here. Was this part of the pattern of, of these films? Well, it, you know, the snowball at the top hat. I oh, yes, sure. Like throwing a pie. There's another th thing there, too. You can hit the wrong people with a pie. Get an audience mad at you. What do you mean? There are certain characters you just don't hit with a pie. We found that out a long time ago. Whom don't you hit with a pie? The girls were hit with a pie. Oh, the girls. oh they don't mind yeah. that at all. Yeah. I remember a lot of people that wanted to hit Lillian Gish so bad <laughs> because she was always so sweet and yeah. innocent. But, uh, well, now, for instance, here in television, uh, oh, this is about eight years ago, something like that, Milton Berle got Ed Sullivan over to make an appearance on his show, and he hit Ed Sullivan with a pie. And that audience froze up on him and didn't get another laugh while he was on that stage. Well, now, that's a very uh, strange thing. I'm just trying to think about that. Offhand, it would be funny. You're hitting someone who's deadpan, you know, with a pie. Wouldn't that be funny? Why? You know, he became sort of a sacred figure in the meantime. Is that the idea? Is someone who's so serious you, you can't kid? No, it's just certain people you just don't hit with a pie. That's all there is to it. W was this so? But would this have happened in silent films? I oh, mean, sure. Certain people you can't hit with a pie. If I had a grand dame who was dogging it and putting it on, yes, she was a gray-haired woman, but she was so overbearing and everything else that the audience would like to hit her. Then you could hit her with a pie, and then and they laugh their heads off. But if she was a legitimate old lady, uh, old lady, and uh, a sincere character, you wouldn't dare hit her. So this, I hadn't thought of that, but generally, if she's a phony, that's different. Yeah. In almost all the those same thing films, goes with the man. In almost all those films, though, there, there, there were uh, enough people to hit because you were kidding all the, the frailties that are in, in. I'll show you how seriously they used to take our stories. In the uh, Navigator, it was an ocean liner with nobody on it but the girl and myself, and we had drifted across the Pacific Ocean on a dead ship, no water running, no lights, no nothing. So we're just like being on a desert island, trying to survive. And we run aground, stern first, off a of cannibal island. And uh, through the binoculars, I can see that they're the wild type of cannibals. They're headhunters. Well, it's just a matter of time that they're going to come out there and get onto this ship. And we spring a, lake, uh, a leak in the stuffing box which means we get out and see this water pouring in around the driving shaft. But it can't be plugged from inside. It's got to be done from outside. Well, automatically, there's a deep-sea diving equipment 
right there in the set with us. So the girl put, helps me put it on, and she's up there to pump air to me. Well, we laid out this gag in advance and had it built by the Llewellyn Iron Works in Los Angeles. We got about 1,200 solid rubber fish, about a foot long, and hung them on catgut, violin string, that are transparent underwater. And then hung them from this rigging so that a school of fish, we could make a school of fish go past, circle around back of the camera and, and continue, and with one spot to break it when we wanted to. So my gag was, while I'm down there trying to fix that stuffing box, that a big uh, fish came up and tried to go through the school and couldn't make it. And I see a starfish clinging to a rock, so I got the starfish off of the rock and let it grab my breastplate. I stepped into the middle of the school of fish and brought it to a stop and then turned and brought the, the big fish through and then turned and I directed <laughs> traffic <clears throat> and then went back to my job. Well, the gag photographed beautifully. We preview the picture and it lays a beautiful egg, not a giggle from the audience. We can't figure it out when we get home. It, says, well, it might be one of those things, the mechanics of it, that the audience trying to figure out how the thunder we ever got a shot like that. <laughs> we're down. We're actually photographing around 20 feet deep. And he says, well, we'll try it at the next preview and see. Next preview, the same thing. It finally dawned on us what it was. I went down there to stuff that stuffing box to keep the girl and I from falling into the hands of these cannibals, and I had no license in the world to stop to go help a fish go through that traffic. It was simple as that. Simple they, they as were, that. They were as serious. They took seriously the whole situation. They, they, that's how serious. Now, although I'm getting laughs down there trying to stuff the stuffing box. Yes. But as long as I kept to my job. But their mind was on the situation uh, you yeah, and the girl done. were in. That's right. Now, to prove it, we take it out of the picture, and, of course, our picture travels the way it's supposed to and, and finishes great. And I, I took that sequence and put it in what they call the uh, the uh, trailers. In other words, it says, this, the, coming, coming next week, uh -huh. Keaton and the Navigator, a few of the scenes, uh, high spots, I just saw a couple of flashes of this and that, and that, this scene was in it, and it, out, it got an out-and-out out belly laugh. That got the belly laugh. When, when it was out of context. Story. Yeah. yeah. Because they weren't worried about the actual uh, trouble you and the girl were in. That's right. I did a picture called The Cameraman. One of the silence. A newsreel cameraman. And I got into a tongue war down in Chinatown in New York uh, trying to photograph things. And I got cornered by them and they didn't want any pictures to go out. So they started after me. So in the, and I'm down to the last reel of the picture. And it was a, a, a very good picture for us. It was a big laughing picture. And it got down to finished there, and when they started for me, I ran down fire escapes and our rooftops and everything else to get away from them and to the finish of the picture. We previewed that, and our last reel takes a nosedive. What was wrong? After a, the, the rest being swell, see. Well, what happened? We finally figured that one out. I deserted that camera. The audience didn't like it. You say you deserted the camera? I, I left the camera there when the Chinaman started after me. So we have to go back and retake that take that sequence. I don't desert the camera. I kept it with me in the chase. I see. That's and what then it was happened. all right. Then the picture. It had to be with you all the time. Yes. I didn't dare that desert it. it. Because they were identifying themselves with you all the way. Yeah, that camera was yeah. too important to me for me to just desert it. That was it. What about the matter of laughs, building for a laugh? So if you don't think they took our stories seriously. Yeah. What are the way you would build for what the end was the belly laugh? Would you, would you plan, this, you know, was first a titter, a giggle? Or, no, or, or, no, no. We, we always try to construct for that. Always try for that. And none of us ever made a picture that we didn't go back and set that camera up for at least three days, sometimes longer. There's something you said around. And it wasn't a case of uh, adding yeah. laughs here or there that failed us, as it was to help yeah. the high spots. So we need another one. Or, yeah. Something else to happen about now to help build that laugh bigger. But it has to be part of the whole. It can't yes. be brought in from nowhere. It <laughs> no, has no. to be part of that whole design. No, no. A poison thing to us was a, a misplaced gag. A misplaced gag. Yeah. 
It'd be a great gag, but it didn't belong there. You know, even though you have a beginning and an end, and that is all, at the same time, there is a unity throughout, even though that thing happens accidentally. Well, yeah. when I say that the, the padding of the middle is easy, because once you've got the start and you know where you're going, you know where you're going. It's, that's the easiest part, to go in and gag up and, uh, and keep your story alive. And you know, Mr. Keith, earlier, in. you said something about today you wouldn't be able to do certain of the routines you did some 40 years ago, yet... A funny thing happened. A limelight is not too old. You were, you and Chester Conklin, I believe, were in Charlie Chaplin's limelight. That's right. When that tremendous vaudeville acrobatic routine, and you bounced around like a rubber ball there, the three of you did. Oh, I still turn over as far as that goes. Oh, what of uh, the art of Chaplin? Uh, I think on, on, when I met you ten years ago, you mentioned The Woman of Paris, a film he directed, I think. The Woman of Paris. You That's right. You his greatness as a director there. What was it about him as a director? Well, Charlie was one of the best directors ever in the picture business. The Woman of Paris was with Adolf Mongeau, his first motion picture. Edna Purviance. Edna Purviance was the girl who had always been Chaplin's leading lady. And uh, he made this high society drama, The Background Paris. He just directed it. And uh, for the first time on the screen, in that dramatic story, he kept doing things by suggestion. Well, every director in pictures went to see that picture more than once just to study that technique. He absolutely revolutionized the director, directors of pictures. You say by suggestion. Could, could you sort of give an example? Well, he wanted Adolf Manjo. He wanted the audience to know that Manjo paid for the apartment that Edna Provence was living in. And the way he did it was that he called on her one, one evening to take her out give her a little bouquet or something like that. And he looked in the mirror and saw a spot on his collar. He took the collar off and went over in a bureau drawer and got out a clean one. And that That's, tells the whole story that, right that there. That told the whole situation. And uh, this was and this was the first time something this sort happened in films. Yeah, yes. It was not diagram, but suggestion. Yeah. That's right. So Woman of Paris was yeah. one of the films that revolutionized the directing. I'll show you something yeah. that leads into that. I went into pictures with Roscoe Arbuckle. I mean, his, his pictures are the first ones I appeared in. And I'd only been with him a short time, and he says, here's something you want to bear in mind, that the average mind of the motion picture audience is 12 years old. It's a 12-year-old mind. Sure entertaining. I was only with him about another couple of months or something like that and I says Roscoe something tells me that those that continue to make pictures for 12 year old minds ain't going to be with us long <laughs> well it was only a couple of years later a scene like this with Chaplin's kind of proved that that people it jumped yeah. the minds jumped much faster than we were making pictures that's marvelous the same principle applies of course to we hear it today applying to television and radio the same False belief yes. that the public isn't ready for an adult or a use the imagination. What Chaplin did and what you appear to do in so many of the other things is allow the imagination of the audience to flow freely. Oh, sure. Very thin. I always tried to do that. I always wanted an audience to outguess me. And then, then I double cross them sometimes. <laughs> I think if I may just return to limelight for a second. Uh, here's a, a film that deals with old-time English vaudeville, music hall, and Chaplin called on you and, and was it Chester Conklin? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. With this routine, and yet both, all three of you were pretty mature men by That's then. That's right. Yet, what was it? I mean, we think of the ability the three of you had, the, the physical ability and the imagination to do it there. It threw everybody in, in seeing, I remember seeing that particular sequence. Well, I don't know. I guess... All lucky that we can move fast, and still can. I mean, how do how do you find working with a live audience? In contrast, oh, I always to... like a live audience. When I first tried a television show, when it was a young business, we were working to an audience. Then later on, they talked me into doing them just to a silent motion picture camera. Well. It don't work because no matter what you did, 
it looked like something that had been shot 30 years ago. It didn't look up to date. It just looked old-fashioned. But the same material done in front of a live audience. New reaction, fresh yeah. reaction. People sitting in their living room where there's only three or four people. Well, this one here, if don't laugh out loud to start the others laughing. It's not like being in a motion picture theater where you got a couple thousand people there to help you laugh. You're looking at just a dead machine when that you do it to a silent camera. And the can laughs are absolutely no good at all. They don't ring true at all. You can tell those a mile There's a false note all the way through when there's the mechanical can laughs in there. But the live audience, that's a different proposition. And the same material, I only need two-thirds of I can eliminate a third of the material to do a half-hour show, work it to a silent camera. All right, now take and do the same material to a live audience, and I can throw one-third of that material away and save it for the next show. Because, of because the, the laughs... The audience's reaction. Their, their reaction will make you work to them, which you don't do to a silent camera. You don't work to a silent camera, but you do to an audience. You mean hearing they, their they, laughs? They space it for you. When you find a laugh is going to come up, you don't just hurt that laugh. You, you help build it. And so Where I, I slide right past it to a silent camera. Because <coughs> hearing the reaction of that audience, <coughs> hearing that reaction, you actually add something else, like a wave. As That's like right. On top of one wave on top of another. That's right. Mr. Keaton, uh, thank you very much for giving us just this bit of uh, a touch of, the, of that period known as the golden era of comedy. Anything else you care to add? Some reminiscence or oh, something? I think you covered it pretty good. <laughs> and perhaps someday you'll be female on a horse again. I'll do Charlie to you, Oywin. <laughs> Ten years ago it was. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In any event, thank you very much for being our guest and being the, the artist you are. Thanks a lot. Adios. Adios.